All right, we're here today with Killian Journey. Uh, I don't even know what kind of title to put on your name because I feel like you have, I don't know, five to 10 different titles. It could be ultra runner, it could be mountaineer, skier. What would you, what's the best way that to describe yourself, would you say? Well, well I, I don't really like to have tags or like we, we try to tag everything in this life and it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I don't feel that that way of of classifying it really it really resonates with reality. So I would say just a guy that likes to go to the mountains and, and runs or ski or climbs just as tools to go to the mountains. I mean, I think that's a so like a just mountain dweller. I, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that can be good. <laughs> um, so. I'm excited to talk to you today. Obviously, you've done have some incredible achievements under your belt and some just really cool experiences and adventures. But I know one of the things we want to talk about today is something you just wrapped up in August, the Alpine Connection or Connections. And it's just, uh, I mean, I feel like to most people, especially that live in the States or even in Europe, the idea of running or hitting all uh, 4,000 meter peaks of the Alps in a row, (laughs) which uh, it seems almost unbelievable. And you did it in 19 days. It was was 75,000 meters of elevation, which is like summiting Everest like eight times or something like that. Uh, Tell me, First off, where did you get the idea for this for this adventure or for this challenge? Yeah, it, um, well, uh, I have been living in the Alps uh, uh, for ten years uh, in the early two thousand tens, and and uh, I I had been doing some some different routes or some link ups or two three summits, and I had been thinking about. Uh, Mostly do some big link ups in the summits in the Valle area and in the Chamonix area in the Mont Blanc, mm-hmm. um, and and then it was mostly like trying to stay on the ridges all the time, but uh, it it just uh, stayed there like uh, as 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 ideas for uh, around ten years, and then last year I did a, a similar crossing in the Pyrenees uh, that lasted about uh, eight days, uh, linking the three thousand meter summits in the Pyrenees. And it was interesting because it was kind of um, a long push, like uh, eight days uh, on, on this kind of nonstop uh, philosophy uh, mm-hmm. in, in kind of technical terrain. And, and then that opened my, my mind on like not doing what I thought to do in the Alps on like leaking some regions, but trying to link all of the different ranges and uh and I started to to think about yeah what could be the way to yeah to to link all these all these mountains on mm. yeah kind of following the ridges following a a pretty logical line so the, and you grew up in the pyrenees so this the, kind of the and you you said you already did that challenge so that was kind of did that feel more was that which one felt more personal to you? Was it was it the Pyrenees or the or did the Alps feel it? Or just in that in that regard, uh, they they felt pretty similar and different in a way because the Pyrenees I had been growing up in there, but I mm-hmm. had not been like really climbing in the Pyrenees for for twenty years because I I moved first to the Alps and then to Norway. Right. So uh, I had memories like, but very blurry memories and like. Uh, <laughs> remember pictures in the books from when we were kids like climbing the summits but didn't really yeah recognize that those mountains anymore so it oh, feel wow. like kind of going back to to a home but a, a very far away home uh-huh. while in the alps it felt more like uh, mountains that i knew because even some regions i, I had never climbed before but but in the valley and in in, in Mont Blanc area there I felt more, yeah, it's, I, I had been climbing here a lot more. So so I would say kind of, uh, yeah, they felt both uh, home and both uh, kind of discovering. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because you did, 
you were doing this adventure at the same time as at, that UTMB was going on. In fact, I think you were fairly close to the course at times, right? Um, uh, yeah, well, it, it was, uh, yeah, uh, it's not that, uh, you, you plan on that because that, uh, like a, okay. <laughs> a big project like that, like it's, I, I didn't know how long it will last. If it would last like for, um, yeah, two, three, four, five, six weeks, because it's, it's so big yeah. that uh, you cannot really plan on like, yeah, day to day where you will be because it's mostly depending conditions. And, and then it, for me, it was two big parameters, uh, counting there. Um, one was early season. Uh, it's, uh, it's more snow in the glaciers. So if you travel mm -hmm. alone in the glacier, then it's a lot of holes that, uh, and bridges that you can break and, and fall in a crevasse. Sure. Late in the season, as I did, the glaciers are very dry. So you see most of the holes. So if you travel mm -hmm. alone, it's never safe to travel alone on a glacier, but if you travel alone on a glacier, then I could see a bit more the holes. But on the other way, like late season, it's much more rock falling and it's much more uh, base grounds that they are hard to climb. So I, I had these two things on mind. I decided for the late and, and then I was racing Sierginal. So it was okay. I f after Sierginal, I, right. I wait a bit for the weather and, and I started. And the season, it was more on, 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 that conditions thing and then of course if you are one month doing things it's many races that happen around so it's it's sure, just sure. a casualty yeah yeah so did you so you said you weren't sure how long it would take you did you have a specific goal in mind or were you just going just going for it and see what happens uh well i i i had a i made a plan and like uh with with the roots and and I had been reading the topos of all the routes. I think in total it was one, like around 160, 170 climbing routes uh, that I needed to okay. do. So, so I, I had the, I had studied the topos and, and, and I had it a bit of mind. Uh, but then it's uh, on a long thing like that, uh, weather conditions, they make a lot of difference. So, so oh, I, yeah. I had the baseline and then it's just like, I don't know if here conditions will, allow me to go faster or slower. And at mm -hmm. the end, like it was, uh, I think it was four days that uh, I added to like the perfect conditions, perfect feeling that never happens. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was pretty close to, to what I yeah estimate. Wow. And I, just so other people know, what, what was the amount of time that you had spent awake, kind of in activity mode, uh, Shout out the Koros. Um, and and then how much time were you taking to rest or recover or sleep? Because obviously when you're going for, you know, not necessarily, I mean, you beat the FKT by quite a, quite a margin, but mm -hmm. that going for these, you know, faster records, you're kind of just going all out on it. So what, what did it look like as far as rest and recovery, if any at all? Yeah, no, I, I think um, uh, I dialed it pretty well here um, because I finished well recovered then. But uh, mostly it's... Um, uh, well, the thing is, was when I was in the mountains, then I was really sleeping pretty little, um, like mm -hmm. uh, one and a half, three hours uh, per night and then doing like uh, 19, 20 hours a day um some days longer like some or like some pushes it was like 30 32 hours uh, push but then when i was going down to the valleys in between the different ranges um then i i was kind of biking in between the ranges and there i i slept longer so i did some like 5 to 7 hour sleep uh, nights what felt amazing uh <laughs> so bet. yeah After basically one and it was a half that. Hours. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that sounds, yeah. And, and you took, I think I read that you, there was one day that you did take a, like a zero day because, uh, I, I think the weather was crazy or something like that. Yeah, it, it was one, actually it was uh, a few days of bad weather. Uh, some of them I, I was just going on and then it was one day that, uh, it was, uh, I took a complete rest day because it was, um, uh, 
thunderstorm with the snow and the part I needed to go, it was, uh, uh, yeah, you don't want to go there in these conditions. And then it was too far to go to do some other summits that day. So I said, okay, just take yeah. a rest day, recover well, and then continue. Yeah, but that that probably felt pretty good, and I'm guessing the day after that was a, probably a good day. <laughs> yeah, it was it was good because after that it was uh, three days in the Mont Blanc range, which is okay. probably technically the the, the most difficult um, um, mm. routes, and and also a lot of exposure. So it it was good to to rest and be fresh, uh, both physically and mentally, to to do this uh, very long push. So when you're doing long uh, expeditions or adventures like this, what is, how do you prepare gear wise or what are, what are some like essential items that you're taking with you? Cause obviously you're not hiking it. You're like fast packing in a way. So what's, what are some like key pieces that you need to, that you always take with you on these types of adventures? Uh, Well, here in the, in the Alps, it was, um, yeah, first is uh, is the technicity of the routes. So um, it's never too technical, but it's like up to what would be like a five nine uh, in, in in American climbing grade. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, and then like ice wise, uh, yeah, you have some sections like uh, that. Yeah, it, you can have some meters and ninety degrees or so. So. So then it was mostly on that. Um, I I was going with running shoes all the time. Like uh, I have a, a pair of uh, uh, Tomir 2 waterproof. And, uh, okay. and then I was knowing that, yeah, I, I can climb the rock on that, knowing that, yeah, it's, uh, well, uh, you, you make a choice there. Um, yeah. And then like for the crampons, I, I, I took different crampons I have and, and changing pieces to make it fit very well in the in the shoes. Okay, and then knowing that with this mix, then you need to adapt the technique to to how to ice climb with uh, this. So it's not the same as climbing with rigid boots, but it's more like the the old technique in the 1930s, like uh, with the charlotte and like the 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 ten points uh, technique. So you adapt the technique uh-huh. on that, and then I was bringing. Um, uh, Sixty meter, five millimeter. Um, diameter rope uh dinema so to do up sails one safety carabiner to to do up sails a light harness um i had like uh two cams and uh one ice axe uh one ice crew so some places i needed to like if it was vertical climb with one ice axe and then the ice crew and <laughs> then use an ice crew as an ice axe so you, okay. you need to adapt the techniques to to your knowledge on that um, yeah. but basically on safety, it was this, and then, uh, I was bringing, um, like tights, uh, jacket and then down jacket, uh, and rain jacket on top. Uh, and then, uh, gloves. I, I, I worn three pair of, uh, gloves because with a lot of the climbing, I was oh, yeah. climbing all the time with the, with the gloves to, to save my, my skin. But, uh, anyway, like I. I used three pair of gloves during the crossing. Uh-huh. Um, uh, yeah, can, those are the basics, mostly like how yeah. that, and, and then, yeah, good headlamp because it's a lot of hours that you are climbing bridges on on, mm-hmm. on, on technical terrain and and on that. Um, and then something more like for the, um, yeah, uh, I had the, the, the Coros uh, Vertix, uh, so like to, okay. to have good battery, to have the map. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, I had a, a power bank. Uh, well, the, the battery of the, of the headlamp, it's a, it's a power bank actually. So, okay. um, uh, so I had that with, um, then the phone, uh, and, and then, um, yeah, so, that's, that's basically all. <laughs> so with the, tra- for tracking, do you carry a GPS locator or do you use your phone? Fo- how do you, or were you just kind of like did, for your team to track you? What did you use for that? Yeah, I had a, a tracker, um, okay. uh, a tracker field. So mostly it was for, for the team that was following me. Uh, and so I didn't need to, to send messages or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and, and then on the, yeah. 
I had the phone and, and in the Alps is uh, coverage most of the time. So I could send messages uh, to, to say if right. I, okay, I'm, yeah, I stopped because that or that, don't worry. I'm guessing at a lot of places you probably didn't have phone reception. <laughs> um, well, in, in the Alps, it's, it's pretty much like you have almost everywhere. Like it's, it's not like uh, oh, in the US okay. or, so that's, uh, okay. yeah. That's interesting. I never do that. <laughs> okay, cool. That's actually, that's pretty useful because in <laughs> certain situations. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. I didn't like, then like when you are doing these pushes, like the phone, like I maybe open it like two times a day, like to, yeah. to look if I was in a good you were, way. Or you weren't, you weren't watching to football. Guess, but, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no. Yeah. So you, you are not <laughs> no using all of the battery. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's funny. Yeah. The, uh, and so you were using the Coros Vertex, you said? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, so anyone who uses Coros, I always like to ask them this question. What, what was your battery life left at the end of the trip or did it, or did you have to charge it at all during, during your, during your, uh, expedition? Yeah, I, I was charging it when, when I was going down from the range. So, okay. um, uh, I don't know, like the longest, uh, what was the, the, the longest push, uh, in, in Mont Blanc or in Ballet, I think it was like, uh, in Ballet, it was four days push. So okay. then I use it for four days. Yeah, um, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, no, it was good because it was four days, like 20 hours a day. Uh, and then when I was going down, um, uh, to the bike, then I was, uh, I, I used the, the Dura, the, the, the bike monitor. So then yeah. I was charging the watch. Um, okay. uh, and then like, I, I wanted to have like extra battery. So in case I needed to be, use like, um, track back, I, I use it like a few times, like the, the track back function. Uh, right. on, on the map. So like, yeah, I wanted to, to be always like safe on, on the battery. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's always blows my mind. I, I only have the Coros Apex two pro, but even that it just, it's almost annoying because yeah, I'll, because it lasts so long that I forget where I put my charger. And so then yeah. I'm always trying to, <laughs> trying to find, uh, where yeah. I put it. It's yeah. Good. That's the one I use for training my, my everyday, like, uh, uh, training and I, I charge one per week. So it's, uh, it's, it's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then on your feet, you said you were wearing the normal Tomir twos. Yeah. I, I have okay. uh, two pairs, one that was waterproof and one that was not. And, and I used the waterproof until Chamonix and, and then the, the other for the last, uh, for the last days. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, and you know, we review shoes here, believe it or not. So we, a lot, our trail team, I've run in the two mirrors. Um, a trail team has, mm -hmm. we've reviewed them, uh, and, you know, really enjoy the shoe. Can you, can I ask you about, you know, how it is, uh, running your own shoe brand or starting that and kind of the, how you decided to dive into that journey, which is entirely different from a lot of the other things you've done? Yeah, no, sure. It's, it's a big difference from like, uh, yeah, being just, um, sponsor, uh, by a brand where like, you can have uh, things to say and like uh, the feedback of the athletes is always appreciated and mostly mm -hmm. on the on the development of gear but uh, it's a lot of things that uh, that are uh, uh, run by by other directions let's say and 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 as someone that i i'm a geek on gear i love to to do prototypes to to try things uh, it was always in my mind to to start something but it's always like a dream that you believe that you will never start because it's it's a lot of of things uh -huh. but uh when when the opportunity came to and i met the, the people at camper and and they had a bit the same vision on like mostly i think at the end is like to to share the values on what was the role of a company in in the society and and in the on yeah, on, on, on ways of producing for the environment for for the industry so so we share that and and then it was more, um, yeah, work to, to find, uh, to build a team of people, uh, with, uh, yeah, uh, all the, the designers, but also all the commercial part and all the, uh, marketing part and, and all the back office. Yeah. So like it was, uh, it was a very short, uh, start because in one year after we decided to, to go, like, uh, we <laughs> launched our first product. So it was very, very quick, but yeah, it's, um. Uh, uh, it's great because 
you, uh, the product side, like I, I love it, uh, how to, to design things that uh, I like it and and that mm. uh, I believe that uh, it's in a direction where where I, I want or I wish all the industry is going with more durability and, and with more um, ease to, to repair or to replace uh, pieces. Yeah. Um, and on another way, it's um, like how, yeah, to, well, to the, the human part, yeah. And you're very sustainable, sustainability minded. It's, it's very important for you to take into consideration what's, you know, the waste that's going into products or the travel or anything like that. I know you, you limit your travel to cut back on carbon uh, emissions and, and you're very, you're very mindful about that. And so I imagine that that's also a big part of your vision for normal and, and I, and I have to say with a lot of shoe brands, you know, we review a lot of shoes, work with a lot of shoe brands. Sustainability is for sure a buzzword in the industry. A lot of people like to say it, but <laughs> there's a big difference between sus like sustainability, the word on a website and the actual, the actual practice of it. And so tell me about how, how, how you take that, into consideration for for your own brand. Yeah, well, first, like, is to 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 acknowledge and to to understand what that we are not perfect and we will never be perfect. Like me as a, even if I try to reduce my my footprint on the travels, I still travel. I still uh, have a, mm, a big impact sure. on on my daily life. And and same for a company, but it's like what we can do with the tools we have and, and how we can make an impact somehow. And, and like you can, uh, yeah, look to sustainability in many different ways. Uh, when it comes to company, uh, when it comes to the product, you can look on that on, on looking for materials that, uh, they can be, uh, I don't know, like uh, biodegradable or like uh, recycled or recyclable, mm -hmm. um, we, we believe, and, and I believe that, um, the, the best way is to, to make products durable. Um, yeah. To, to have less products at the end is like to, to, to consume less. Um, yeah. And that comes like with the choice of materials, but also uh, with making a product easy to repair to, to, to make their lives longer. Mm -hmm. And then like to find solutions to, to recycle those materials. So like in at the end, like durability in, in this big spectrum and also like, Durability is not only physical, but it's also, and it has a lot to do with uh, uh, business model and with um, what's called like emotional durability. And that's something that it's hard to to tackle as a brand because like most of the, yeah, how how any or, or most of the, of the companies that uh, we sell products, uh, what uh, the, the business model it's it's based on on our consumption. The more you yeah. sell, the more you consume, the more benefit you can have. So, can we can change? How can we change the the business model so it's not depending on 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 our consumption? And that's that's the hardest part, eh? much more than the product. And, For sure. and and making products that visually we don't need to change every season the colors and, and mm -hmm. say okay yeah it's a we change these two small things so changing yeah. making changes only when we believe that it makes a, a, a real difference on the product uh, or when we find better solutions uh, for for the durability or for the repairability and and then trying to to make a business model that it's yeah it's not yeah. on that and that's the key at the end. Yeah, I think there's a, a a real value in making a product and then actually developing it further and then putting out the next model when it's ready, not when the timeline of, you know, investors or yeah. something else dictates it because at that point it's just and that's why you see a running shoe and then a month, you know, the next year is the half version with the upper update. And then, and they, it's every year you, they stick to that schedule, but, and then you look back in between, you know, versions 
whatever, 35 and 40, there's really hardly any change at all that affect that it didn't need to be done except obviously to sell more shoes. And Mm -hmm. I think there's a real value in that. I think that paired with what, like what you said, the durability aspect, if you wear a shoe for 600 miles, um, you know, sorry, not, (laughs) I can't translate Mm -hmm. off the top of my head to kilometers. Um, Mm -hmm. but if you wear a shoe for that long, you're getting twice the lifespan out of it of of a lot of the other shoes in the market. Yeah, no, exactly, and and that goes for everything like uh, like the carbon footprint of the shoe. Like uh, if you are using for for more time, like uh, it will be reduced, and and the uh, all the circuit will be slow. No, so the 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 production, but also like the transportation of these products and and the end mm-hmm. of life. Um, uh, like uh, so so it's like uh accepting that we will have a footprint and that we will consume products and that i want to still go to the mountains and, and i need this gear to to go there how can we slow down this process and, and then it's like how how can we work for it and and that's uh yeah, yeah that's our our model yeah i love that um so i wanted to ask you your you're a fairly new father. You have two. You have two daughters, and you have one on the way. Congratulations, by the way. No, thank you. Um, yeah, I just saw the uh, the announcement from last week. Um, that's pretty exciting. I'm sure that was a huge life change for you. Can you tell me how that affected you as far as just training and goals and life in general? Uh, well, it. It changed like in many things uh, uh, for for good, I would say, um, and and also like uh, it changed on the the way mostly the how we organize uh, our our daily life. Uh, like before, like uh, I could go training when I wanted. I was waking up and say, okay, today it looks up. Uh, yeah, not good weather now. I will wait <laughs> a bit. I was waiting now it's just okay like the girls are going to school this time to this time so I'm training these hours the weekends we do very little training it's mostly to do um short when they are sleeping or or that mm-hmm. so we we do long tours with them and then when it comes to to planning races and projects it's it's what we can do also like uh, around uh, around them so that means uh, less tra- it's uh, much less traveling so this year for example I have been uh except uh this trip in the alps and uh i went to zegama uh race in uh in spain in in the um, yeah early season yeah. uh uh but uh yeah if not so, uh, we were home all the time so mostly it's like trying to to be home present and that that's good for yeah. training because at the end like you have much less stress uh, and, and much yeah. more routine so i think in in a way yeah it's uh it's um like the routine is much more yeah yeah Yeah. you know what you will do like uh, next month at this day because it would be probably similar than today (laughs) right i love that no that's good i feel like in a way yeah it it almost simplifies the process in a way you know you know exactly the time you have to train the time you have to spend the family and then you work around that and i think that's can be hugely beneficial Mm. um are you when you were gone for those 19 days, did you see your family at all during that time? Yeah, um, uh, actually I was traveling with, uh, with the girls to Sierra now. Okay. So I was spending one, one week with them there. And then um, Emily, my wife came and then uh, they were there for the first week I was in the, doing the cool. trip. So, uh, so yeah, when I arrived at, uh, at, uh, uh, after the Oberland and the days at Sasgras, I yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I was with them. Uh, I didn't spend much of time because I was most of the time in the mountain, but some afternoons. Uh, yeah. And then they traveled home, and and I spent ten more days there, uh, and then nice. travel back. But that's, I feel like that's such a. I don't know, in a way that's almost cheating because if you see your kids on a, at the end of a huge long day, that's like gives you such a boost that it's almost like you can't get that anywhere else. You know what I mean? Like that's like yeah. an emotion that's an emotional boost that like that other people can't get, I feel like. Yeah, no, that's for sure. Then like the physical recovery is less because they they are uh-huh. saying, Okay, papa, let's go and play and <laughs> yeah. not to go to yeah. the couch and 
and lay uh, <laughs> legs up. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the other part that you'll think about after after a long hard effort of training or something, then you come home and it's and it's right back into the to the family life part. <laughs> um, so, and so you grew up f- famously with parents uh, who worked or lived in the mountains, and you know everyone hears about how you as a three year old were summoning some your first three thousand meter peak or. And then as a five-year-old, your first five, 4,000. Yeah. But you, you did some, you did some ex, uh, some interesting things as a kid that I would say most kids probably don't do, especially here in the United States. Um, do you, and this is something I've, I promise you, I think about this all the time. Do you feel like you in particular, like that being raised like that, truly made you who you are and that is very specific to the environment that you grew up in um i would say the to be moving a lot of hours as a kid to practice sports and like not not for competition like i i i didn't enter competition until late but like just to be out in the mountains like skiing or like hiking Mm -hmm since a kid for every day like many hours i think that that builds a base that of course it's it's there um but i think it's mostly yeah probably just to to get used to that like uh more uh yeah on the physical side yeah it, it starts building uh of course and and, and when you yeah. are a kid it's where where you are more plastic so you can get more adaptations and, and and these adaptations are easier to get when you are a kid than than if you start training at 30 40 years old mm-hmm. um but also i think it was mostly just to to get very comfortable to be out in the mountains and to be out there and to feel that that's uh, that's my place uh, most the, yeah. more than uh yeah than the than the physical adaptions and yeah and so this is an interesting thing i think about as well like especially in America, I feel like there's a lot of, not of safetyism or more like, oh, mm-hmm. I, I always hear from my, I always hear from my friends like, oh, my kid, uh, like we do this bike ride to school and I'm, I'm trying to make it longer and involve more people. And it was, uh, I built a longer route, it was two and a half miles, not that far, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, someone that was going to do it with us was like, I don't think my daughter's like going to be able to do that. And which I'm like, there's so, I feel like there's so many things and that's a common thing in America. Like even walking a mile for a kid because we're so car dependent here is almost seems like a, an unfathomable challenge <laughs> to a lot of families. And do you, I guess what I'm trying to say is, do you feel like that, do you feel like there needs to be some sort of pushback on that thinking or like what are ways or even what are ways to challenge kids to go outside of their comfort zone? Because I'm thinking when you were a kid, like kids don't generally want to do, I mean, if you're raised in that environment, you will do that. And you, and if your parents push you just a little bit, and I'm not say, saying, you know, do things that are abusive, but like to the level of just challenging you beyond that next boundary and then building on that. Do you think that's something that we could use more of today? Um, absolutely. And, and I think it's not only in US, but uh, it's, it's globally at the end uh, that we are, yeah, uh, and kids are, they do what they see, I think, first. And that's the first thing. Like uh, we can tell our kids to, to eat well, to do that. But if we are not doing it, they will they will not do it either uh they will see mm-hmm. why why i'm doing it so first is like to to show by example um but then like also this um yeah we we look for safety everywhere uh and, and not we are too afraid of of doing mistakes or too afraid of of um uh, failing and, and that also for our kids not like this uh, overprotection and and we need or I, I believe that we need to to let them learn on or having difficulties to to overpass them and and just like to 
to be yeah to to be flexible on that like okay it's uh we we need to walk uh, it's a bit farther we need to to first like for like physical activity it's it's so key uh like for to to for health like uh, if uh, yeah if we are um not moving like uh, our metabolism and most of the of the diseases that they are happening today uh, from many of the most of the cancers and all the diabetes and yeah. and, and ma- many of the of the health problems they come from from the lack of activity and, and from and from the food so if if, yeah. if we are putting that seed to our kids to yeah, yeah just uh yeah, just take the car or just be in the trolley and, and not not to get used to move and to, to eat well, like uh, uh, it's um, it's much harder than to change it. So I think mm-hmm. uh, as kids, like, yeah, you, you, like I see with uh, our daughters, they are used to, to get out and to get out and play. And, and yeah, of course, as a parent, like when you let them out uh, to, to go jumping rocks or in the forest, you are a bit afraid, okay, they will hurt themselves or if they jump and fall. But it's part of, of learning. It's part of knowing yeah. where are the limits. And and you need to, yeah, of course, sometimes like say, hey, don't do that. <laughs> but uh, but most of the time to try to encourage them to to try things. And 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 also I think this connection with uh, with the nature, it's, it's very important. So they understand why we need to move, why, where the food comes from, no? uh, like, uh, uh, can we pick these berries or not? Can, where, where the, the, the food comes, uh, and, and, and to have this connection with the body and with the, with the environment, I think it's, it's key to develop when you are a kid because afterwards it's, you get this, um, yeah, you get used to do some things that, they are very hard to change afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, especially as a kid growing up in that environment or just it's, it's so much cause you're building on that every day. And you know, that's something that will re- stay with them later in life. Even if they go away from it, even if they do other sports or something mm-hmm. that the idea of building that mental strength and physical strength and even, you know, healthy habits it will always come back to them. I think that's super important. And I love that. Now I did read somewhere that your mom used to give you kinder eggs as a reward for doing, uh, some like after some time in the mountains or stuff like that. Is that, I I read it in an interview actually that she did. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you give your kids kinder eggs after as a treat or, or anything else like that? Yeah, well, not Kinder eggs, but like, yeah, I think that that was just an example. But it was more like, yeah, if uh, if we do a long, long hike, uh, we have like a, uh, some cinnamon roll or uh, or some sounds good some <laughs> snack that is, yeah. If uh, when we arrive to the hut or when we are back uh, there, like uh, we stop and we eat these and yeah, yeah, I love that. I mean, I honestly, I feel like that's the key to getting kids to do hard things is yeah. <laughs> the reward at the end. Um, I remember there was one time I was doing a hike with my kids and we had, yeah, it was like, um, a sour patch kids or something. It was like, like, it was like a thing at the end, but it was in the car. And during this hike, which wasn't super, it was like five miles, but with in the last mile, mm-hmm. I re- realized that I had lost my keys along the way. Oh Yeah. <laughs> And they had the biggest breakdown <laughs> because not because <laughs> we lost our keys or it was close to getting dark. It was because they, they, we weren't going to be able to get into the car to get the reward. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. It, was, yeah, it a- had nothing to do with being tired from the hike. No, none of that. None. It was just, uh, just <laughs> it was the, the reward, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess that's how important it is uh, to kids. Mm. But, um, and I did want to ask you, so... In that regard, so you talked about how you didn't start competition till later in life. You were doing a, a variety of sports and outdoor activities. Um, and this is another one of my favorite things about a lot of elite athletes that they, uh, and there's a book on it called Range um, mm-hmm. that kind of explores this idea that there are very specific athletes like say Tiger Woods or Andre Agassi. And then there are the range athletes like Roger Federer 
or Kobe Bryant or even Michael Jordan who uh, who not only who growing up do a multi an array of sports which we used to do in the US all the time now it's very it's very specified and and then they kind of choose their path in high school or you know as they're later in life and then uh, nail that down like for instance Roger Federer I think he, when he was in uh, he didn't focus on tennis until he was 15 years old or something like that and yeah I wanted to know how much how much you feel like that variety of activities growing up and not so much of a focus on a singular sport and competition how that has helped you get to where you are today yeah I, I think um and that's something I see a lot here in Norway, actually, with their policy to, to children, children's sports, is that um, first, uh, the variety of sports, first, first it will help the kid to, to see what it likes, uh, because uh, maybe like uh, as parents, we will have a preference for one sport because it's what <laughs> we like or we like yeah. to do, we like to see. So we... Even if we are not doing by purpose, the fact that we are liking a sport more probably will, uh, yeah, yeah, invite the kid to, to do that sport too. So, mm -hmm. like uh, the the fact of practicing more activities, it it will make the 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 kid to to probably find what what he or she likes most, yeah. uh, and then also to develop different skills that. Uh, they they are useful at the end. Specificity mm -hmm. is important at, at at a certain level, but uh, most of the sports share like uh, the big big base, and, and 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 it's more like to get used to to the routines and to the yeah what uh, what sport yeah what you need to develop for for that yeah. uh, when it comes to to basic skills. So it's not really what it matters, but yeah, I think this by yeah. To, to do a variation of activities it's great for like the mental side on like finding what you like and and to be able to 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 change uh, mentally from from one uh, activity to the other uh, yeah. and then also like uh, the the competition side uh, it's uh, like kids develop differently uh, some kids will develop very fast and be very talented uh, young some kids will develop later if we are doing like a competition uh, since they are very young, they will develop um, a sense of um, of failure uh, and a sense of uh, uh, hierarchy that it's uh, it's very strong and, and in kids is very strong. So if the kid's saying, mm -hmm. okay, this kid is stronger than me or another kid is like, no, I'm the best. Uh, and yeah. most of the things they come from from the the timings on development that they are different from kid to kid. So maybe we are frustrating a kid because like he is not um, uh, succeeding if success can be a word here, but uh, yeah, uh, like uh, he is uh, winning races uh, or not winning races and, and maybe it can like come after. So I think they, to avoid competition as, as something that is hierarchic and, and that it has a rank until later on, it's uh it's positive on, on on allowing this development and on pushing on doing a sport for fun not for like a not for like a reward an external reward on like uh, parents or coaches or teachers saying you are good but just like enjoying that uh, that activity i think that's key like uh, yeah. to find and i think they go together like a variability of sports so like it's they are having fun practicing and, 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 and yep. discovering kids. They like to learn. They like to, mm -hmm. to learn biking. They like to learn swimming. They like to learn uh, climbing. It's, it's, it's the learning process that they really like a lot, much more than, than being good. And, yeah. and if we are putting them the pressure on like, you need to be good because like, uh, even if we are not doing in purpose, but if it's a ranking, they will say I'm better. I, I'm, I'm yeah. better. So if we are like eliminating that and and keeping the fun and keeping the the that uh, it's uh, for me it's key on like developing the long term uh, yeah the long term athletes. Yeah, I know. I th it's I think a lot of times people forget that sport is supposed to be fun, not 
not a means to a career or a college or university <laughs> scholarship or something else. It's just supposed to be, it's a game. They're all games. They're f- supposed to be fun. And I think that point is missed on a lot of parents now. Um, yeah. And sad. Um, and then, so in that, in that regard with the variety of activities and sports, I think you're also unique in that way because you, you take the, essentially take the winners off or even a lot of other time off for running. And you really focus on periodization for specific, uh, specific goals or races. you those six to eight weeks before that you really dial in when you need to. And I think that's also something that even as amateurs and, you know, people who just run for fun here in the U S have a hard time doing is taking, just taking a break from that singular activity. So can you speak to how that helps, how that helps you mentally, physically, or even makes you stronger for your next goal is, you know, switching up your activities? Yeah, no, I'm like, as, as I said at the beginning, I like to go to the mountains. Like if it's running, skiing, it doesn't matter much. And, <laughs> yeah. and I think that also helps me like uh, uh, mentally, like to, to, to be looking forward to, to do another activity, another movement, to be climbing, to be skiing, to be, to be running because it, uh, it gives this uh, novelty and like the, to, to want to do something that it's, yeah, that is different from what I'm doing today. Uh, so that I think it's, uh, mentally it's, uh, it's great to not be thinking all the time with the same activity and then physically it, um, it's, uh, it's helps on like, uh, I know what I want to develop at this period of the year. It don't need to be like, uh, for example, if, if my focus is I want to, to prepare this race in, in the summer, I know that, uh, 10, 12 weeks before that race, I need to, to be very specific. Uh, on the mm-hmm. training on like uh, simulating the uh, neuromuscularly and like uh, um, physiologically the, the same kind of uh, stimuli that I will need for the race. But before, if I want to develop like, uh, let's say, uh, uh, metabolism, like the, the, the mitochondria don't know if you are skiing or running. It, it just knows that uh, it's, yeah. it needs to, to, to give you energy with uh or produce energy with uh with fat or with uh, glucose so that that you can do cycling or skiing or whatever so if you know what you want to develop then it's uh it's great to use uh to do different activities because also then maybe you can uh rest other parts uh, mentally or rest some some the muscles or the joints or, or all that yeah yeah it's interesting because and this is i you know i was talking about some other athletes uh, so like Michael Jordan or Nolan Ryan, and you might not know who he is, but in the U S um, they were during their off season, they didn't play those sports at all. They would do like Michael Jordan was a big time golfer. So he'd golf the whole mm-hmm. off season. Didn't even touch basketball. Maybe, maybe touch it, but you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, Nolan Ryan, he was a great pitcher pitched till he was like 48 years old in baseball. He would work on his ranch, do other activities. Cal Ripken Jr. for the Orioles. He would play basketball. He would play basketball all off season. And I think a lot of times people don't realize like your body needs, not just needs a break, but also needs to, you need to use other muscle groups and, and build on those. And then it, it all ties together in your overall well being and, and, and health and that can benefit you in so many, so many different ways. Yeah, no, exactly. And yeah, as I mentioned, like mentally, it's, it's very important also, like, especially in, in that's also like in high competitive sports, like, uh, I think it's, um, it's different, like, uh, maybe on the amateur that, uh, that probably the, the moment like going to a race, it's, uh, it's some pressure, but it's mostly like for fun and it's your re- like relaxed moment. But people mm-hmm. like uh, that, uh, we are racing, and and we expect to win. Like uh, when I go to a race, like I I sure. want to win. I train for that. Like it would be like a, a false modesty if I say no. I want to, yeah, to, to have <laughs> yeah. a good race. No, yeah, I, I train for, to to, for try sure. to 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 win. So the pressure on like uh, doing that it means that 
yeah, doing many months in training, you are pushing to the limit, you are training hard, uh, you are focusing on that. So after that, like, to have the time to relax, to have the time to do other activities, it's uh, mentally to get back to to want to to push hard and to 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 do that again. I, yeah, it's a, it's key, and I'm, I'm doing other activities that will allow you to to keep this uh, this stimuli that is not mm-hmm. specific, but it's uh, that, and, and to keep enjoying while developing that. It's uh, it, it's just a win win situation. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions. One, I just wanted to ask you, I forgot to mention this earlier. What, so in a, something where you're doing 20 hours a day of activity and hard activity, what, what's your nutrition look like for that? Yeah, it's, it's been changing. Uh, like, uh, it, it, it depends a lot on, on that. Like, uh, for example, if I, I will be doing like a, a hundred mile race, 20 hours, one single push. There, I will try to eat um, like uh, uh, pretty high uh, carbs every hour. Um, okay. So then I will try to eat, yeah, uh, every hour uh, a different amount. It, it depends the the the, the race I will be doing, uh, but it can come from sixty to 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 more than one hundred grams of of carbs per hour. And that okay. will come on gels, it will come on, on liquid, it will come on, on different so forms. Just but whatever, okay. Whatever, but trying to, to eat very cons- like constantly, all the time, and, and, and right. to keeping uh, that. Um, but for a project like in the Alps, where it was 19 days, uh, this strategy will not will work in the short term, like in a race. Right. That's, that's the right. strategy I, I need to, to do if I want to perform. But in the long term... Uh, it, it will have some problems uh, more on on uh, yeah it's not really respecting the circadian rhythms it's not really the, so the the hormonal the hormonal uh, rhythm it will change it will also change like uh, the some of the organs will be working all the time so uh, mm-hmm. you will not them yeah them the time to to recover so it can take some problems on. Uh, more like a, a gut permeability or, or things like uh, like that. So then in, in, in the house, for example, my strategy was to eat uh, four times every day, more or less, but trying okay. to have like big meals. And, and okay. I consume a lot. Like uh, I was uh, I was spending an average of more than 8,000 8, uh, calories every day. Oh, and, wow. and I didn't lose any weight. So I was eating like more than it, uh, like uh, almost 9,000 calories every day. Okay. So I needed to eat these nine thousand calories uh, in like mostly two meals, and then like uh, two small meals during the day. So I was trying to keep like very natural foods and eat big amounts uh, a few times. So it depends the the duration of the effort, the kind of effort. Um, then you will do use more like uh, carbs, pure carbs, mm. uh, right. fat, a mix of it. And another, uh, yeah, uh, you will okay. try to, for example, in a race, you will try to to avoid more, like, I don't know, fibers or, or some things during sure. the race. But in a project like the Alps, I, I need to eat that also during the push. So depends the, the effort, like, uh, I will change on that. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. All right, awesome. All right, so last question. What's What's your, like, one thing out there that you really just want to conquer or do? Cause you've done some, I mean, you've done the FKT of Everest or the fastest summit, uh, with no oxygen and you've done obviously this Alpine connections. What's something that's like spinning around in your head? Well, um, it's fun that uh, when I was younger, I, I had those dreams. Like I want to win these races. I want to, to do these things and and it was kind of yeah that's my next goal is this mm-hmm. and i think uh yeah luckily i i have accomplished like uh, these dreams i had when i was a kid or like a kid and, and yeah growing up and 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 in the sport and and now i uh, i just want to have fun and and it's just <laughs> like uh right. yeah day to day like it's uh to have the freedom of not having these long-term goals, it's just like, yeah, I, I'm looking forward. Like uh, now, uh, like last year I was doing the Pyrenees and this opened me 
the mind to do something else. And, and this mm. crystallized with the ALPS project, which has been opening me other doors to do things. But, uh, and this is great because it, it, yeah, having the freedom of like not, not wanting to do something very, very hardly, it, uh, yeah. it awakes more the creativity of, of doing things that, uh, that, yeah, they could be blinded if I, I wanted to win this race another time or if I wanted to do this project. Yeah. Sure. I love that. I love that. It's just, it's even, it's come full circle. It's you started out doing, doing it to yeah. have fun and then you nail, you took, you did your competitions and now you're just back at having fun again. And that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's uh yeah. I think it's moments for everything and I'm and, and trying to enjoy all of them. Yeah, that's great. Well, Killian, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It was, I really had a good time talking to you. Um, and I'm looking forward to whatever you have next for sure. No, thank you very much. And yeah, hope to see you sometime in the mountains. Okay, great. Well, let's do it. All right. Have a good one.